I loved the fact of all the automatopoeia and sound words that we were able to talk about and discuss. And again, I know that it's something that we've been doing basically throughout the year. Anytime we have a sound word, you guys tell me, Hey, Mr. Hill, that's an automatopoeia. You know they're sound words. Today, we have um, definitely been talking about making some using comparative language. So, we're going to talk a little bit more about using some comparisons. Today, I wrote for poetry, a good poet, any good author, is able to paint a visualization using their words. Okay, We're not an artist. We're not actually using a paint and a paintbrush. You paint the mental picture by using your words and your word choice. So, a good writer, a good author, especially a good poet, is able to create visualizations using their words. And then they use comparisons to build meaning. What do I mean? Well, I'm going to read you this example of a poem that uses comparisons that build meaning and how I feel like that this particular poem is using very good word choice to build that visualization picture. I'm not going to tell you the title yet, but I'm going to read the poem. An artist lives in our old tree. She works with mud and wood and fur to build a sturdy twig collage. Her masterpiece is small like her. Blue eggs will nestle in this arch, framed by branches way up high. An artist lives in our old tree. Her museum is in the sky. That poem is not a very long poem, although that poem does paint a very strong visualization. The poem never comes out and tells us what exactly the author is talking about. But because of word choice and because of the visualization that this author is able to, to create, it allows us to think about what this poem is actually about. We talk about repetition the other day, and the, the author, the poet, actually does uh, repeat two lines. They repeat, an artist lives in our old tree. And then right at the end, it says, an artist lives in our old tree. So that immediately should make you think, what, what could live in a tree? Okay, some type of animal. She works with mud and wood and fur to build a sturdy twig collage. Something that could be built, made of twigs and mud. Okay, I don't quite understand yet. My visualization is not very strong, so I'm going to keep reading. Her masterpiece is small like her. Okay, it's a small animal. Blue eggs will nestle in this art. Blue eggs, small animal. What lays eggs? Make some type of collage or whatever. Oh, it's a nest. Little eggs, small like her. Collage, bird nest. Oh, it's a, it's a bird. That's what we're talking about. Okay. Framed by branches way up high. An artist lives in our old tree. Her museum is the sky. So, this poet actually creates a visualization without ever telling us what they are actually talking about. The title of the poem, by the way, is titled Robin, a bird. So, this author does a tremendous job of using word choice, using comparison, de comparing details, to create that strong visualization. She compares the nest to like a collage made of twigs and branches. She then talks about the blue eggs, but she refers to that nest as the, as the robin's masterpiece. So today, for your poem, I want you to try to pick out an animal, an object, and I want you using strong word choice and comparative language, try to write a poem based off of one of those objects or that animal without even coming out and telling them, telling me what that animal is or object is and create that visualization. Writing homework today, journal entry, and then you're gonna do a poem that focuses on visualization. We talked about using comparative language and creating a visualization without coming out and telling me what the actual object, animal, whatever it is you're talking about. So that's your focus today is to create a poem with making a strong visualization based off of your word choice and comparative language. Happy writing.
we are ready for our math. And like I told you yesterday, a three-part series, today's focus is going to be on two-dimensional shapes. Some of these shapes are shapes that you already know, you see every day, we talk about every day. Again, I describe two-dimensional shapes as shapes that if we were to uh, draw in a piece of paper, cut them out, they would lay flat on a desk or a table. So let's look at some different two-dimensional shapes that we have. Up here, I have different table that we're going to use to kind of characterize our different two-dimensional shapes. So off to the left, we have the shape itself. The next boxes are for the name of the shape, how many sides, and how many vertices. You will notice that I do have some uh, drawings in red and blue on our particular shapes that I'll talk about in a second. But let's go through and name each shape. The first shape we have here is a circle. Then I drew some triangles. You can have three different types of triangles. You can have an equilateral triangle, you can have a right triangle, or you can have an isosceles triangle. What does that mean? It does not really mean a whole lot to us in second grade. Just know that all three types of triangles are still classified as a triangle for us in our classroom. Then you move to the typical square that we have, a rectangle. Now, this different shape right here, it's a five-sided two-dimensional shape. That is known as a pentagon. Pentagon. As I flip over and we look, we've got a couple more shapes. So I look here, this is a one, two, three, four, five, six-sided shape. It is a hexagon. Six is called a hexagon. Right here is your stop sign. Yesterday I told you eight-sided. Think of a, a stop sign. It is an octagon. Now, this, we're going back to a four-sided shape. So as I look here, one, two, three, four, okay, with slanted sides, straight lines. This is called a parallelogram. Down here, it's a, you guys would probably refer to it as a diamond, or you would maybe talk about it being a, a kite-looking thing. That is, that's fine, but in our classroom, we're going to call it a rhombus. It again has one, two, three, four sides. And the final two-dimensional shape that we're going to talk about is going to be this shape down here at the bottom that looks like uh, it's got a short line, a straight line up top, a longer straight line on bottom, and then it's slanted, two lines slanted out. And that is called a trapezoid. Now, uh, what's unique is you can use a trapezoid to draw the top of a hexagon, and then you could just flip it and use it to draw the bottom. So you can actually put two trapezoids together and that would create a hexagon. Obviously you would not count this line that's in the middle as you put the two objects together. As you see, I've got on my chart, I've got each shape drawn. We just talked about the name of them and let's talk about our edges and vertices. I'm gonna fill this out real quick and then I'll come back to you. Now I've finished up our chart here, our table. Now let's take a quick look. I've got our shapes in green. Now on the vertices, I've got the vertices circled in red. Vertices you can think of as points. And in two dimensional shapes we talk about sides. The sides I have marked in blue. Where two sides come together to form a point or a vertice, that creates what we call an angle. However, you may hear people say, okay, well, how many angles are in a triangle? Well, there's one, two, three vertices, so there are three angles. The nice thing about two-dimensional shapes is the fact that if you know the shape and you know the number of sides, you know the number of vertices. Or if you know the number of vertices, you know the number of sides because the number of sides and the number of vertices plus the number of angles are always the same for two-dimensional shapes. So as we look at the circle, it has zero sides and zero vertices. As we look at the triangle, there are three sides, three vertices. A square, square has four sides and four vertices. Same as a rectangle, the properties are the same. It has four sides, four vertices. A pentagon, think of the word pent is meaning five. So pentagon has five sides and five vertices. Your hexagon, your hexagon 
You remember, you can put two trapezoids together to create a hexagon. However, remember that a hexagon is a six-sided shape with six vertices. Octagon, octo, eight. So an octagon is that stop sign with eight edges, eight sides, excuse me, sides, and vertices. On a parallelogram, a parallelogram has four sides and four vertices. A rhombus, four sides, four vertices. And a trapezoid has four sides and four vertices. Now, with that being said, you notice that there are one, two, three, four, five different two-dimensional shapes that are considered to have four sides and four vertices. When you're doing your homework or when you are, if we were in school, you might see on your paper it said, talk about a quadrilateral. And you could think of a quadrilateral as any four-sided, four-vertice object. Now, a square, a rectangle, a rhombus, a trapezoid, parallelogram, those are all four-sided with four vertices. So if you hear quadrilateral, that means four sides, four vertices. That does it for a quick overview of our two-dimensional shapes. I'm not going to ask you to do anything. No application problem today. The only thing in math you got to do is you're going to do some iReady math for 15 minutes. Let's recap math. We talked about two-dimensional shapes. Circles, squares, triangles, rectangles, parallelograms, pentagons, trapezoids, hexagons, rhombus, um, octagon, you know, so we've talked about two-dimensional shapes. We talked about how if you were to draw a two-dimensional shape, cut it out, lay it down on the table, it would lay flat. You don't have anything to do with two-dimensional shapes except kind of look around your house and see if you notice any two-dimensional shapes. But the only homework that I'm asking you to do in math today is to get onto your iReady math and do iReady for 15 minutes.